Well, I couldn't be more delighted to have been invited back here. Thank you, Josh and Matt and anybody who had a, a part of that invitation. This is really a pleasure. Um, thank you. So a lot of theological hay has been made of the fact that Jesus' first miracle was changing water into wine at a wedding. Certainly, it's symbolic of God's blessing of the sacrament of marriage, and it's a foreshadowing of the marriage feast of the Lamb, the party of all parties. But I'm going to make even more hay of this by starting my reflections here, because Jesus didn't just make wine, he made excellent wine, astonishing the guests with its quality. And he did it at the end of the celebration, which could only have extended the event. At least I would have stayed longer if there was excellent wine earning him the reputation of a wine-bibber and a glutton. So why did Jesus take that risk? I think it's in part because it underscores the reality that the gospel isn't just good news that we learn about with our minds. It's an invitation to an experience of God that we must have with our bodies and our souls. And the invitation is always the same, to taste and see that the Lord is good. They feast on the abundance of your house, writes the psalmist. You give them drink from your river of delights. And on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. And on that day, he will swallow up death forever the sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. And of course, the promise and the invitation is to taste the best food and wine of all, the Eucharist. This is my body given for you. Jesus' incarnation means, among many other things, that creation itself is good and that the ultimate reality of the universe is a feast given by the bridegroom for his bride. The ultimate reality is personal, it is communion, it is love. So what does that have to do with poetry? You might be wondering. I'm so glad you asked. I have long believed and taught hundreds of students through the years that all of the arts are an invitation to experience the world as gift. For to taste and see that creation itself is a river of delights is to necessarily move one step closer to the giver of that gift. This is so because art is an experience of the beauty of creation, not an argument about it. All artists know this by instinct, whether they acknowledge it or not. That's an important piece of it. They may not even know, but that's what they're doing. And poets, I will argue this morning, are the ones at the top of the mountain shouting or whispering provocatively, taste and see that the Lord is good to a world that is increasingly too busy to stop and wonder. Poets are also the ones bringing out the finest wines, extending the feast, inviting us to remember why we're really here and what matters, which is being together in community and inviting others in to taste and see that the Lord is good. I've devoted my career to the power of the literary arts because what they do has no substitute and no parallel. No substitute and no parallel. And also because it just might be that the church's biggest problem right now is that we have forgotten how to invite people to taste and see, right? And to see how marvelous this love feast really is. So I'm making the case for poetry as theological invitation. My desire is twofold, that we turn, return to the poetry in the scripture with greater aesthetic attention, but it's also my desire that all congregations grow in the arts that provide this kind of experience, including giving the sharing and reading of poetry a chance to transform the way we see the world, and especially the way we see each other. So I'm going to keep my arguments simple so as to save time to walk with you through a few of my favorite poems, because art is experience, and it's one that's even more enjoyable when shared. So I'm going to first talk about how poetry invites us to experience the goodness and beauty of creation, 
and of Jesus as the ultimate form, right, of that creation, and then how poetry invites us to the possibility for transformation that comes from tasting and seeing the goodness of the Lord. So those are the two parts. So first, poetry as an invitation to taste and see the goodness and beauty of all creation. As you all know, the liturgical invitation to the table, taste and see that the Lord is good, that you'll hear the minister sometimes say, comes from Psalm 34. So let's briefly consider this psalm as the poem that it is. I wish I were a Hebrew scholar so that you can better see my argument, but Michelle Knight's got your back. <laughs> um, but which is that the beauty of the poem as a work of art is essential to the experience that it offers the reader. Right? So you have to get it as poetry to get all of it. An experience that goes, as I've said, beyond argument. But we'll just have to suffer through my lack of knowledge of Hebrew. Okay, so here are the first eight verses in the Revised Standard Translation. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Now, to remind you, the context of the psalm is important. It's that David is praising the Lord for his deliverance from Abimelech. Okay? The reason that's important is because the psalmist is an artist. He is a poet who is inviting us to experience with him, he's inviting us to experience with him the joy of God's goodness in his deliverance. He is not simply relating the event. He has made a celebratory song out of it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, David has had an experience of reality that requires a response, and that happens to be the starting point for poetry. The theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who I love, calls this need for a response to the goodness and beauty of the Lord the demand of the beautiful. And although the quote that I will share from him is a bit of a mouthful, Right, Kevin? <laughs> Von Balthazar can have a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, I cannot overemphasize its importance for a theology of the arts. Balthazar is saying that because of the incarnation, truth, goodness, and beauty have been revealed to have form. Truth, goodness, and beauty exist in the world and not just in Plato's mind. Right? Form, argues Von Balthazar, requires a corresponding form that matches it. The only fitting response is, for David, a song that can be sung, memorized, and shared. All right, so here's the quote from von Balthasar, and it's, it's long, but bear with me. Through his body, man is in the world. As he expresses himself, he acts and intervenes responsibly in the general situation. He inscribes his deeds indelibly upon the book of history, which, whether he likes it or not, henceforth bears his imprint permanently. Here, at the very latest, man must realize that he is not lord over himself. Neither does he rule his own being in freedom so as to confirm form upon himself, nor is he free in his communication. As body... Man is a being whose condition it is always to be communicated. Indeed, he regains himself only on account of having been communicated. For this reason, man is whole as a whole. Oops, wrong one. Man as a whole is not an archetype of being and of spirit, rather their image. He is not the primal world word but a response. He is not a speaker, but an expression governed by the laws of beauty. 
laws which man cannot impose on himself. As a totality of spirit and body, man must make himself into God's mirror and seek to attain to that transcendence and radiance that must be found in the world's substance if it is indeed God's image and likeness, his word and gesture, action and drama. Now, there's a ton of content here, I realize that, and I'm not gonna go into all of it, don't worry. But notice that Balthazar insists that the reality of being a created being, of having a body, means that all of our language is a response to the original being, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ, who created all things, was before all things, and in whom all things hold together. We cannot confirm form and meaning on ourselves. Rather, we discover the beautiful gift of our lives here as beings made in the image of God, and then of the love of God for us in spite of our sinfulness, right? Since his goodness and love are beautiful, the appropriate response must also be beautiful. It is not enough for David to simply text God and say, thanks God, praying hands, smiley emojis. It's not enough, okay? Since I'm at risk of losing your attention by quoting this dense philosophical comment followed by this non sequitur, <laughs> let me regain it again by saying that this is a lot less complicated than it appears to be. Consider what happened on October 12th, 2021. On that evening, that very evening, my cousin's son, a little fellow by the name of Jackson Cerny, at that time four years old, was watching a sunset with his parents in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. This is not the exact photo, but it was something like this. At one point, he jumped up energetically, pointed his finger at the sunset, and declared, God is painting the sky. And of course, my cousin immediately sent all this comment around to all everybody on WhatsApp and whatever. Now, why was my cousin compelled to share this? Because Jackson's response was commensurate with the event. Through his response, he became a poet, the author of an undeniably poetic utterance. Pointing with his finger and speaking with his mouth, he became a seer and a sayer of the beauty of the body of the world. To say God is painting the sky is to render an astonishing experience of beauty with a fresh metaphor that helps us to see it for what it really is. That's poetry. So let me draw on one of my favorite poets of all time, Denise Levertov, to describe how the poet's attention to the beauty of creation demands a beautiful response and also invites the reader into that experience with her. First, a poet, she explains, through attentiveness, has a powerful experience, a sequence of perceptions that are, quote, felt by the poet intensely enough to demand of him their equivalence in words. He is brought to speech. So when Jackson saw the sunset, the experience led to words of praise. It woke in him a demand, a need to respond to something that adequately corresponds with his experience. And that's the primary condition, she says, of being a poet. But the fulfillment of that demand, continues Levertov, take a sip, is to contemplate, to meditate, words which connote a state in which the heat of feeling warms the intellect. To contemplate comes from templum, temple, place, a space for observation marked out by the augur. It means not simply to observe, to regard, but to do these things in the presence of a god. And to meditate is to keep the mind in a state of contemplation. Its synonym is to muse. And to muse comes from a word meaning stand with open mouth. Not so comical if we think of inspiration to breathe in. So, as the poet stands opened mouth in the temple of life, contemplating his experience, there come to him the first words of the poem. The words which are to be his way into the poem, if there is to be a poem. I can't recommend her new and selected essays on poetry enough if you are interested in this. Now the act of attending with the senses and emotions, one's body, comes first, followed seamlessly by contemplation. The word contemplation is theologically charged. It requires the recognition of the presence. Something special is going on here that did not originate in me, is really what's being said. Something that demands and deserves my attention and 
my response. So the easiest way to say what I'm getting at here is that we need to read poetry to experience all the arts because we have lost the ability to see the sunset as the gift for it, that it really is. That's why we need all of the arts, because we have lost this ability over it, always in danger of losing it. So let me share with you a famous poem that insists on poetry is the best way to recover sense of wonder. It's likely to be familiar to you, but because it's a great work of art, it keeps giving new insights and discoveries to the readers, and not just because the poet happens to be a believer. This happens with great secular poetry, too. And this is because of what von Balthasar is talking about. The good, the beautiful, and the true are inherently bound together. If you have one, you have some of the others. Where you have goodness and truth, you also have beauty, and it can't be otherwise. So here's the poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins called God's Grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. Two glorious stanzas, at which I will only be able to scratch the surface. This poem was written during the Industrial Age in Victorian England, and Hopkins was rightly worried about the world being bleared and smeared with toil and man's smell. I should think about it, it had to be pretty bad. He was worried that the flaming out of God's glorious creation would be crushed by humanity's lack of care for it. That this poem is more relevant now than ever before is part of the reason why I've chosen it. The poem is about what scholars call the Anthropocene, the age that marks, that show that the marks of humanity's trotting are all over creation, never to be fully erased. In the 21st century, as you know, efforts by many climate change experts have become desperate to try to stop the destruction. But Hopkins has a slightly different view. He's asking us to stop and take another look at what's going on. Yes, generations have trod, have trod, have trod upon the earth, but still there lives the dearest freshness deep down things. Notice that this dearest freshness can only be found deep down things under the surface destruction because creation is being renewed daily and it will be ultimately renewed during the new creation. The speaker insists that the world is so charged with the grandeur of God that no activity of humankind can ultimately destroy it. We can certainly do our best, right? And we will destroy things, but not ultimately, because it will be restored. Now, that's just the argument of the poem, and that's pretty easy to discern. But this is art, not argument. And Hopkins invites the reader into an experience of that freshness deep down things. So if we were in class together, we would see how all this works, but we're not, so I'll just give you a few, a few hints. The rhythm, along with the rhyme scheme, is what gives the poem first its downward worry, right? Have trod, have trod, have trod. It's not have trod, trod, trod. It's have trod, have trod, have trod. And then it's upward creative energy. Oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs. Hopkins invented something called sprung rhythm, and I won't go into specifics, but it's basically taking the expected rhythm of iambic pentameter, which is the most common rhythm in English poetry, and detonates it, causing surprise and delight for the reader. Here's a typical couplet written in perfect iambic pentameter. pentameter. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. This is Alexander Pope. And so, 18th century. 
Notice the order, the regularity, as if the world can be fully categorized and accurately described like a scientific textbook. Now you see the iambic stresses and that there are five, hence iambic pentameter. Dun, 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 okay? But notice how Hopkins twists it. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. Notice how flame out and shook foil disrupt the regularity of the iams that are expected in iamb iambic pentameter. Again, I'm not going to give you the specific vocabulary for this, because what I want you to focus on is its effects, how you feel the rhythms of this poem in your body. You don't just see it on the page, right? And that's why poetry is better read aloud. It's because you feel it. You know, it will flame out like shining from shook foil, and it disrupts it. Art is experience, not argument. When I was here at the Henry Center for that glorious year of study and fellowship with other scholars, I did a lot of research into the field of neurocognitive poetics. I wanted to see what your brain looks like on poetry. And as I'll get to later in this talk, the brilliance of the word resonance to describe our experience of all the arts, and especially music, is that the experience is an embodied one. You feel it in your gut, your bones, deep down in your soul. Those embodied experiences are all generated, of course, initially by something going on in your brain. Now, what I discovered did not surprise me, but did delight me to no end, okay? And that is that the way that poetry forces you to slow down, even over a single word that the poet has defamiliarized for you, just a single word even, actually has a calming effect. When a person experiences anxiety, whether stimulated by something real or illusory, which we do every day, right? It's part of the modern experience. The amygdala, that little part in there that looks like a snake or something, it's like the lizard brain. The amygdala is overactivated, and that's your fear response. And what that does is it disrupts the efficiency of the functional link between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, which is your executive center. It compromises the connection between the two. So recent research in neuroscience indicates that it's this functional connectivity between the two that is uh, required to be able to regulate one's emotions to reduce anxiety, All right? So when, you are, when that is overstimulated, you can't learn either. You know, so it's a really interesting connection there. So don't leave me yet, but because here's the kicker especially when we are considering God's grandeur, for instance, as theological invitation. According to recent research, when the meditation includes gratitude, the response is even more pronounced across the nervous system. So if the poet even gives you, through one word, an experience of gratitude for the beauty of that word for something, it calms you down even further. Poetry is an invitation to taste and see that the Lord is good. To taste that goodness, to really taste it, is to be filled with gratitude. And it's to want to join in with others, to respond, to celebrate, to feast. And thus are the arts born, and thus are they renewed. And that leads me to my second point, which is to say that poetry is an invitation to the possibility of transformation that can only come through this experience. It can't come any other way. To begin this section of my talk, I'll share another of my favorite poems of all time, I Dwell in Possibility, by uh, Emily Dickinson, the great poet, Emily Dickinson. I'm just taking a little moment to just say, isn't this great? Thank you all for being here. I know that not poetry is not everybody's thing, but mm, just bear with me. I dwell in possibility a fairer house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye, and for an everlasting roof the gambrels of the sky, of visitors the fairest, for occupation this, the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. Now this is a little more complex, so I'm gonna read it again experience it, I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose, 
more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, trees, right? Chambers of the cedars, impregnable of eye, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky, of visitors, the fairest, for occupation, this, the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. There is so much to say about this poem and how marvelous it is, but of course I have to restrict myself. Its beauty comes from imagining language as a dwelling place. Language is a dwelling, because it is a dwelling place. We live inside of language. All of our experiences are mediated by language. Not all of them, but a lot of them. From the stories we tell ourselves about the meaning of our lives to the response we have in the traffic jam we're stuck in, none of these are really possible, fully possible, without language. So Dickinson insists that to dwell in poetry is to dwell in possibility. It is to dwell in hope and joy. In the immortal words of that other poet, Farrell Williams, it compels you to clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Uh, you know, I'm happy. And it's more like I'm joyful. My husband's like, what does that mean? It means, it's Emily Dickinson explained what that means. <laughs> there's no sky, there's no limit. I feel like a room without a roof. To say that to dwell in poetry, to say that to dwell is poetry, in poetry is a fairer house than prose, is to say that we settle for a prosaic life when a poetic one is always possible. We choose the prosaic life over the poetic one. And what is a poetic life? For this we can turn to this final stanza where Dickinson lets us chew on some interesting ideas, right? So first, of visitors, the fairest. Which means, I think, that when you dwell in the house of poetry, you just get to sit tight and the poetry comes to you. As many different visitors as you want, with only the most important realities in their mouths. Everyone knows that Dickinson was uh, quite reclusive during her most productive years, but don't think that means that she was lonely or joyless. Far from it. She invited people she wanted to converse with, but since there were very few people alive who were as alive to the poetic life as she was, she decided much more often to select her own society. That purpose is in this last stanza too, the double meaning of the word occupation. To occupy the house of poetry completely is to have the occupation of being a poet. That was certainly Emily Dickinson's call, and I honestly can't imagine how impoverished the American imagination would be without her. But we, too, can occupy the house of poetry, if only for a short period of time, as we experience with the poet what she is doing, which is spreading wide her narrow hands to gather paradise. So beautiful. Our problem is not that the world is empty of God's grandeur and glory. It is that we don't sit in the house of poetry long enough to gather it in, to taste that grandeur along with the poet. Now, why don't we do that? Because it's difficult, especially for us late moderns, to slow down, to stop doing, and start receiving grace. Consider these words from, of all people, the pragmatist philosopher John Dewey, whose book, Art of, as Experience, Art as Experience, is undervalued. This is a really interesting quote. The aesthetic or undergoing phase of experience is receptive. It involves surrender. But adequate yielding of the self is possible only through a controlled activity that may well be intense. And that activity, I would argue, is attention, right? Deep and focused attention, very intense. In much of our intercourse with our surroundings, we withdraw, sometimes from fear, if only of expending unduly our store of energy. Perception is an act of the going out of energy in order to receive, not a withholding of energy. To steep ourselves in a subject matter, we have first to plunge into it. When we are only passive to a scene, it overwhelms us, and for lack of answering activity, we do not perceive that which bears us down. 
we must summon energy and pitch it at a responsive key in order to take it in. Like you have to be able to respond. You have to pay attention and be able to respond in order to actually have the experiences. It's a lot there, but it's very, very interesting. They, uh, these words explain why engaging with art, especially the art of poetry, is as essential as it is difficult. It requires a totally different kind of energy to slow down and look along with the poet at something that we have missed. The thing is that something that we have missed is the part of reality that actually has the capacity to enlarge our souls, right? But we've got to respond. We've got to put ourselves in the position for that. It is much, much easier, as he alludes to here, to keep our souls small and fearful and comfortable. A lot easier, it takes a lot less energy. Bishop Robert Barron is excellent on this point, love his books. He describes that the spiritual journey is one of moving from having a small and fearful soul, the pusilla anima, from which we get the word pusillanimous, to the large and generous soul, the magna anima from which we get one of my favorite words of all time, magnanimous. To receive that which expands us in that way requires willingness to change and the kind of receptive energy that Dewey describes here. Another way to put this, maybe simpler, is that the poets are trying to transform us from Martha's into Mary's, right? Which is much harder than it seems like it should be. The reason we late moderns need to be attentive and receptive to the invitation of poetry now more than ever is because we live in an increasingly accelerating world. A society of Martha is on acid, right? The sociologist Hartmut Rosa has described this change very lucidly in books like The Uncontrollability of the World and Resonance. I'm really into Hartmut Rosa right now. He's kind of shocked by how many Christians and uh, Art, artists are responding to his work. I'm like, you shouldn't be you know, surprised. I just got a chance to meet him when I was at Cambridge, and I was like, you should not be surprised by that at all, and you'll see why. My hypothesis is this. Because we as late modern human beings aim to make the world controllable at every level, individual, cultural, institutional, and structural, we invariably encounter the world as a point of aggression or as a series of points of aggression. In other words, as a series of objects that we have to know, attain, conquer, master, or exploit. And precisely because of this, life, the experience of feeling, feeling alive and of truly encountering the world, that which makes resonance possible always seems to elude us. This in turn leads to anxiety, frustration, anger, and even despair, which then manifest themselves, among other things, in acts of impotent political aggression. Whoa. To be a modern person is to breathe the air of the illusion that the world is controllable. We are enculturated, especially in the United States, to go after a bigger piece of the pie, greater success, more productivity, your platform. A world of miserable Marthas for whom busyness and exhaustion has become its own status symbol. What Rosa is so brilliant at describing is how being unable to slow down and inhabit time and reality differently is what prevents us from experiences of resonance. Those moments when we feel, like along with Julian of Norwich, for instance, that all's well with the world. I mean, just be in this moment. All things shall be well. Right now, without needing to control it, okay? So here's how Rosa describes the transforming power of experiences of resonance. Whenever we resonate with another human being, it's not, it's not just through the arts, the arts is one of the peak places of resonance, but we can experience resonance at all times, we have to be open to it, right? So whenever we resonate with another human being, a book, a song, a landscape, an idea, a piece of wood, we are transformed by the encounter, although of course in very different ways. There are encounters that leave us a different person in their wake. And there are adaptive transformations that produce barely noticeable, if only temporary changes, for example, in our voice. In every instance, however, a change in how we relate to the world is constitutive of resonant experience. When we resonate with the world, we are no longer the same afterwards. 
experiencing resonance transforms us. And it is precisely this transformation that makes us feel alive. If we no longer allow ourselves to be called or transformed, if we find ourselves no longer able to effectively respond to the multitude of voices all around us, then we feel dead inside, petrified, in short, incapable of resonance. It is easy, I think, from these quotes to see why we need the arts more than ever before. It is because they teach us how to inhabit time differently. They teach us that a patient, receptive attitude is more important than an impatient, product-oriented one. They teach us that we must be first before we endeavor to do, or that all of our doing will be so much dry straw. Now, you shouldn't need me to say that just reading poetry is not gonna solve this problem. You can, you can read poetry all day long and still not experience transformative resonance. Just ask anybody with a PhD in English, okay? Instead, we must do what we can, I think, to challenge our brothers and sisters first to inhabit time differently. To my mind, this begins with keeping the Sabbath, because it is then that we stop trying to wrestle profit from the earth, as Abraham Heschel puts it, in order to, quote, care for the seed of eternity planted in the soul. In the soul. From there, we should build what I call a Sabbath mindset, where we create and protect nests of time, and then learn how to guard those nests of time from the cowbirds of distraction, who are always trying to lay their hideous progeny in those nests. That's hard work today, especially. How to do that subject of another talk, and I love to talk about that, so if you ever want to hear me on that, I'd love to talk. For now, I want you to, get, to give you a taste of it. I want to give you a taste of it. And I'll do that with the final favorite poem of mine, one that will also make you long for summer, since we are here in the voids of late January in Chicago. This is called, oh, I love this so much, Lying in a Hammock at William Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. The poet is James Wright. So I'm going to read it twice. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkness darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over looking for home. I have wasted my life. One moment. Remember, poetry is experience. So try to experience this. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life. And again, if we were in class together, or if we were in the poetry reading group that you're going to immediately form in your churches after listening to me today, we would discuss this as slowly and carefully it deserves, and you would eventually be dazzled by its immense beauty, even though it seems simple. But since we are not, I'll just walk you a little bit through it. The speaker is in a hammock in a very specific place, William Duffy's farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. The specificity is important. It is a nod to the fact that each of us have only one life and that any given moment we can only be in one location, in spite of what the transhumanists would like to you know, dream about. Additionally, we have only the present moment, and that is all we will ever have, okay? By virtue of being in this hammock on a fine summer day and of being receptive, one gets the feeling at long last, to being in this moment alone, 
the speaker experiences resonance. Resonance. He notices things the way only a receptive soul can, and time slows way down. He is in the hammock from afternoon until evening, and his observations become aesthetic. They become the necessarily beautiful response, as I mentioned before, to the beauty of the created world. The beauty of the world is so rich that it requires the creativity of metaphor to reveal, just like Jackson, that was a metaphor, right? God is painting the sky. A bronze butterfly, which is a piece of art, right, incapable of actual life or movement, is asleep on the black trunk and blowing like a leaf. Cowbells follow one another in the distance, and most magnificently of all, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. Notice that this metaphor does not create the beauty of, of all things, year old horse dung. It rather discovers it, reveals it, and allows us to experience the moment of that discovery. The world blazes up with the beauty it already had. Needless to say, this discovery takes time, stillness, space, which is why as evening settles over the scene, the speaker concludes, I have wasted my life. The speaker has not wasted his life because he um, didn't write that other book of poems or you know, go to X many concerts or whatever else. The speaker has wasted his life because he didn't sit in a hammock for more of it. The speaker learns that the call to the poetic life is a call to receive the real in the only moment that is available to us right now. And the real is astonishingly beautiful. Beauty that points us one way, home. Thanks for listening, for being here today. Thank you, Christina. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a stage change here. And as they do that, um, I just have one announcement for us. And that is that our next event uh, here at the Henry Center is in just under a month. Um, you can see it on these cards on your table. We're having um, Dennis Edwards, who is a Trinity graduate and the dean of North Park Seminary in Chicago. He's going to come on February 22nd and give a lecture on power and humility in theological education. So again, it will be a Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, we welcome you to come back then if you're able. Um, again, that's Thursday, February 22nd. Um, at this point, we're gonna respond to Christina's uh, beautiful lecture with some time for conversation and question and answer. So to host that, I'm gonna invite up uh, Father Aaron Damiani, uh, who is pastor of Emanuel Anglican Church down uh, in Chicago, in the uptown neighborhood of Chicago. Uh, we're really grateful that Aaron is with us this morning. He's going to start by um, offering a sort of reflection, a response, and then maybe get the conversation going with questions. So if you do have questions when he invites you, there's microphones on either side of the room. Please feel free um, to join in the conversation. Uh, Aaron Damiani planted Emanuel Anglican Church just over 10 years ago. He's been pastoring there uh, for a long time. He's the author of two books. Uh, his most recent one is on liturgy. The one perhaps to mention, though, at this time of year is that he also has a book on Lent. Um, both of those books are available at Moody Publishers. I'd encourage you to check them out. Um, more importantly than his books, he's been a pastor uh, to many of my friends down in the city of Chicago, and we're grateful for his ministry uh, and his church's presence of grace and mercy and joy in the city. So would you please welcome him and Christina back to the stage for this conversation. Thank you so much, Matthew. It's great to be with you all. Thanks for being here. Christina, thank you so much. What a rich time that was. Thank uh, you. As I read your talk and as I listened to your talk today, I was reminded of the role of the, the sommelier. <laughs> and the sommelier, um, as some of you know, is that wine steward. They know their wines really well. Mm -hmm. They tasted the bad ones. Yes, they, and they and, know. Yes. But they've tasted the good ones, yes. and they know what the good ones are. Yes. And more than that, they know their guests. And they can listen to their guests and introduce their guests to just the right wines for just the right meals. 
And I feel that what you did today was that you pulled out Hopkins and, and Dickinson uh, and even um, James Wright, and you said, taste and see, not only that this wine is good, but also uh, get into a, a place of attentiveness and, and receptivity to better enjoy the meal of the gospel. And, and all of us want to savor that meal more, don't we? I mean, we want to taste and see that the Lord is good, but we're in that grind of modernity, profiting and pushing and that doesn't leave any room for savoring and for attending to. And so thank you for being our sommelier this morning. You're welcome. And, uh, and I, feel that I feel the challenge, just the implicit challenge of to, to be a sommelier in training and maybe for all of us to take up that role ourselves that, that we'll never be you know, master poets, but we can sure enjoy poetry we can, we can sample more of it, we can taste more of it, and then we can even introduce it to our parishioners, to our friends, to our small groups. We can pepper our sermons with it. We can, we can usher it into, we can even put it in the church bulletins. Yes. Um, and um, and, and any, other, any other way that we can actually do one of the, actually, to, to, to actually steward one of the most important resources that any of us have in our discipleship, and that is our wholehearted personal attention which is now monetized. And so thank you for, for, for thank you. helping us pay attention to the feast of the gospel by tasting the goodness of poetry. Thank you. That's always my goal. Um, here's my, I want to, so first of all, I want to hear from everyone, every, you know, if you have a question, think about your question. We're going to open it up in just a moment. My first question I want to give to Christina, and that's this. You've given us some poetry that I feel is very, apropos to the season we're in now, the season of Epiphany, and even of Eastertide, um, or of ordinary time, where we are uh, paying attention to the yes of God to creation, the glory of creation, and the fact that the Word was made flesh, and that His glory was revealed, wow, from creation itself, as grace mixes with nature, and alights upon it. But in just about three weeks, on Valentine's Day, we are entering into a season of repentance, and so I want to ask you about who are the poets that are going to help us taste even some of the bitterness and the gall of creation and, and like, be honest with us in a way that maybe sentimentality it has ruined our palate? Who are the Lenten poets that are going to help us repent and, and, and attend to the brokenness of this world? Well, well, first of all, you're precisely right to say sentimentality has ruined our palate. Um, sentimentality has no place in Lenten reflections because it's not real, right? It's, it's a false sense of transcendence or emotional response. Um, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my friend Malcolm Geit, who actually has a book uh, for a poem every day for Lent. It's called a Word in the Wilderness. Every day for Lent, a single poem. And then he has a blog that you can easily go on and he shares his poetry freely. And then he has just a little button that says, buy me a cup of coffee. To which I would respond, yes, click that button. <laughs> you know, if you're getting his poetry for free, support the arts. <laughs> right? um, I, there, there's a collection I've seen. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but it's um, curated by a man named Richard Harris, and it's like uh, several collections for Lent of poems, different poems from across a wide variety of traditions called Hearing God in Poetry. And then beyond that, just go, you would be surprised how many people are just like, here are my favorite poems for Lent, and, and you can get some really good collections one, because it's not just any given poet, right? It would be certain poems by Hopkins, certain poems by George Herbert, that comes up a lot. Um, and, and so poking around can reveal a lot of excellent sources uh, for that, and it's all you know public domain too, so you can get it very easily. Thank you so much. Now, I'd love to hear from you questions or comments that, that the community has today for Dr. Lake. Thanks, Christina, for coming and waking us up again to what really matters. Thank you. Um, I'm taking several lessons home today. One is you've reminded me of the energy it takes to read and receive what Scripture has well. Yes. Okay. But um, I was also reminded, given the topic of C.S. Lewis's 1944 lecture entitled, Is Theology Poetry? And his answer, 
He said, if theology is poetry, it is not very good poetry. <laughs> and so my question then is, as someone who teaches and writes theology for a living, can theology be done in such a way that evokes an experience of God? Can I dwell in the house of poetry or am I confined to the dungeon of prose? <laughs> and when I do my systematic theology, can I aspire to be poetic or do you think that would be a category mistake? I love this question so much because I would argue that every single theologian who doesn't strive for the inherent beauty of what they're writing about is not doing a good job, okay? And I get a lot of this from Hans Urs von Balthasar, um, as you know, because you're familiar with his work, where it's like, Theology is inherently aesthetic, and aesthetics are inherently theological. It's both of those things. And so if you are tapping at the reality of the beauty of the world as created by God and trying to describe that, because theology, after all, right, is words about God, then those words require beauty, a beautiful response that the subject deserves. You know, And so we do a disservice uh, to our readers if we're not at least attentive to that. Now, of course, we can't all be poets and we have different gifting and, and whatnot, but you're actually a, a model for a theologian who wants to write beautifully. Um, and I aspire to do that in my own writing about uh, the arts as well because it, it, requires, it requires it and it will help people to understand it better too. That's the, the interesting thing about it. Like um, the som sommelier, you know, who is there saying, look how, look how this is so good. And I know because I've studied this a little bit more, but I want you to taste it. You know, so there's a difference, as I'm saying, in making an argument and inviting somebody to taste something. And it's hard as a writer, believe me, I know, because I also write, right? It's hard to do that. Uh, but it should be a task that we attend to. So thanks for that question. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Lake. Um, I had a question as you referenced Carmen Rosa's work, especially with regard to resonance. And um, one thing I do find compelling about Rosa's work is that he doesn't believe resonance is something you can kind of attain control. It's just you have to kind of set Correct. the you conditions can't plan it. Yep, yep. for resonance to occur. Um, and I think that really resonates powerfully with what you're <laughs> saying about poetry. Uh, my question is, especially as a institution of theological education, um, training people to have resonant experiences and then uh, um, assist or help others in order to foster their also having similar type experiences mediated through poetry or other, uh, other modes. How can we as an institution help create conditions for resonant experiences um, through things like poetry or the arts? What are some holes you've seen in the way that we do our formation and education as you know, places that are trying to train men and women for ministry? What can we do better? So that's my question. That's, that's an excellent question, and I'm delighted to, to receive it. Um, I'm not an expert, of course, on theological education, but I do think um, the, the number one thing is to slow way down, way down. Less is not more in theological uh, education, especially, right? Because we're talking about formation of people who are trying to teach the gospel, trying to teach theology to other people, trying to preach it. And if we aren't attentive to the soul formation of the students in our classes, then we fail miserably, not just a little bit, a lot, right? So when I, and I think about this as a, as a teacher of, of undergraduates, of course, too, right? That um, the temptation, especially at a place like Wheaton, which is pretty driven, is just more and more and more and more and more. And over the years, I've done less and less and less and less to try to help them to understand that you can't force experiences of resonance. Like I was making that joke about being a PhD in English, but almost everybody's experience of high school English is just like, you just killed the joy of this. My kids me. would say the same thing. Yeah, they would say right? amen to that. Yeah, and, and that's a crime. If you really love literature and you love the arts, that's a crime to have students leave your classroom with less love, right? So I would say 
create spaces in your classes, but also create spaces in the community. Liturgy, as you know, is a, is a very effective means for allowing conditions for resonance, because even though it seems like counterintuitive, it's like, well, that's the same thing, same thing. You never know, you know when it's gonna hit, when it's gonna resonate, and it's because they've heard it over and over, right? I started doing Lectio Divina in my classrooms instead of like a devotional, just for that purpose alone. It's like, let, let this just, sink in, stop talking, just hear some words, you know, again, and absorb them in a different way, experience them in a different way. So thanks for that question. Yes, um, fairly recently I heard um, a professor at another institution, much more fundamental than I think we are, um, who recounted a time when an associate pastor had asked him if he could do a small group in the church focusing on C.S. Lewis's literature. And he was so proud of telling that student, that person, no, we felt you know, only Bible, only Bible studies and whatnot. So as, as, as people also who are going from here to be in charge of catechesis in the local church, how do we catechize the congregant who thinks that you know, poetry was just part of a class you got from seminary and it's just, it's over my head, Pastor. Why? So beyond, beyond just a sermon series on the Psalms, how do we introduce poetry into the, the life of the church and congregation? That's a big question, and I wish I knew the answer to it because, I mean, I'm not a pastor and I'm not a teacher of pastors, but I think we have to do everything that we can when it comes to educating, theological education of future pastors in particular, to stop thinking about literature or the arts as a little flourish or an illustration, right? And instead, be so deeply embedded in themselves um, and invested in it, that it becomes a natural part of the way that they speak and preach, and just way of being in the world. And that requires starting with that as a priority in the theological education, but it also requires the pastor, right, the, the rector, to make a decision to not be in this culture of total work, and make himself or herself available you know, to the, to the arts, you know, and, and you can't do that in a rushed way. I love Pieper's book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, because the argument in there is just so strong. It's like, you, if you do not have stillness and quiet, you do not have the receptive condition necessary to see the real in anything, you know? And so um, that's what you're trying to model up there. Um, so, but then, you know, so it has to start if you, with the leaders, right? And then I, I definitely am a big believer in adult education and doing things like uh, theology and literature, you know, book groups and stuff, because then it helps to slow people down, you know, um, and to have those experiences and not just like think of the world of theology or Christianity as more information or more mandates or more principles to, to follow. But this is a way of life. It's a way of being, as I mentioned, a way to inhabit time. May I share a quick story and then we'll get to your question. On that, it's a, it's a great question, important one. 10 years ago, I was a few months into uh, our church existing and I was the pastor, and uh, I remember in the deep recesses of winter, 2014, just feeling the desperation of being at the end of my energies and capacities as a pastor. Now, I grew up uh, feeling like I should read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I, like I was supposed to get into C.S. Lewis, but I never did, you know? But that, it, was in, it was that winter when I started to, just for the sake of my own pastoral soul, from the pain and the drama of planting a church, where the, where the riches of Narnia fed my soul in a way that I really needed. And so I, I would just say that, you know, from, there can be sideways ways that we find ourselves in literature and poetry. And I can, I can say now 10 years later that poetry's become just a nourishing reality for my own ministry. I need that beauty, I need that I need to see it slant, um, and uh, and so you know, never underestimate the power of a little pain uh, to make poetry come alive and, and to to activate that appetite for a deeper beauty than than our distracted modern Netflix world could offer. So yeah, the the appetite is there. It's just 
Yeah. You, you force it down by not really recognizing it yeah. for what it is. Mm -hmm. And then when you do feed it, you yes. feed your soul, then you feel, you feel that. Then that's what resonance really is. It's mm -hmm. a sense of, wow, my soul, I needed that. Yes. You know, I mean, there's a piece of music, that piece of music by, um, you know, uh, Bach, the cello concertos, G minor, I think, it, you know, I, I'm not a music person, but that one, the cello, you know, that beautiful. I can't listen to that too many times because it's so beautiful, it wrecks me, and I don't want it to lose resonance for me because as the person was asking me, you can't create resonance. It's something that you experience, Rosa, is just like all of a sudden that first snowfall comes and you're like, whoa, and you're taken aback by it because you pay attention to it and you slow down. You know, that can't be created, but you do want to you know, create some situations where it's more likely to happen. And if you're not exposing yourself to poetry at all in a receptive attitude, then you're lessening your chances for experience of that, of your soul being fed. We were talking about this at dinner last night. Even if you just take 15 minutes before you go to bed to read a little fiction or read a little poetry every morning. I read one poem every morning um, after I do my devotions, or listen, I listen to Lectio 365, I love that, I highly recommend that. And it's an app that's fantastic. And then I read the one poem, and then the next day I go back and reread that poem and then read another one. So it's like two poems a day. Um, and that's as much as you need, because sometimes they'll resonate with you and sometimes they won't, but if you're not in the position where you can experience that, and I don't do that out of academic necessity, you know, I do that because I love it. Um, I can sort of anticipate where you'll go with this question, but I'd still love to hear you talk about it. Um, part of fully appreciating, or maybe uh, appreciating more, a particular poem is understanding the mechanics of what's happening. Um, and so that's true, of course, of all literature. How do we, as people who are in a position to either be teaching or learning those mechanics, make sure that we don't lose um, some of the more affective um, parts of the experience. Like, I, meant, I imagine there's at least the mental shift, but are there other ways, as we teach people about literature and poetry, that we can make sure and not lose that fundamental experiential part of interpretation? That's a great question, and as a teacher, it's very, very important to me. Um, I'm always trying to think about ways to do class differently, you know, in a sense. So if you are teaching it, you teach, you know, Hebrew poetry, um, instead of doing the typical sort of thing that you might do, it's like, well, I've done this, and this is how I've taught this, and this is, you know, uh, do something completely different that creates it. And, and you know who, who's really good on this? Walker Percy in a little great essay called Loss of the Creature where he says that the place where you shouldn't be able, to, that you can't experience a sonnet, by which he means have resonance with it, is in an English classroom. And the way that you can't see a dogfish being dissected is in biology. But if you dissected a dogfish in your English class and looked at a sonnet in your biology class, you've actually opened up a better opportunity to, to encounter it, to encounter it for what it is, for what it is not what we want to control or exploit or whatever, get out of it, get out of it. As if, you know, a poem is a bit of information, right? What was the name of that essay again? Uh, Loss of the Creature. Loss of the Creature. Yeah, by Loss Walker of the Percy. Creature. And it's, I'm trying to remember, maybe it's a message in the bottle, I can't remember which collection it's out of, but it, it's just so good. Um, so what I've done is, when I'm thinking about teaching, I'm fond of saying that what a particular lesson costs in creativity, uh, or cost in content, what creativity costs in content, it gives back in energy, is the phrase that I've used. So giving up content in the favor of a creative approach to helping the students to have an experience is so worth it. It's so worth it. So here's an example. Um, I teach a collection of essays called um, Meditations from a Movable Chair from, by Andre Debus. Love this class, very deeply sacramental collection of essays. And I will, for one class period, just get up, turn off all the lights, try to get the classroom super duper dark, 
and just sit and read one of the essays um, in the corner of the room and everyone has to shut their eyes and then just talk about. And so they experience, and the, the essay that I've chosen is something called Country Road Song. And Debuse is just describing how he's running through the neighborhood, what he wore, in which seasons of the year, and whatever else. But you realize, because you've been reading this collection of essays, that he is now um, in a wheelchair and has lost the ability to run. And then there comes this moment where it's just like, he sings, it's, it's a song of praise. I thank God for all those years that I was able to run, for not taking, I can't even, I'm almost ready to cry just thinking about this line. I cry every single time I read it. For, for giving me those days for one month, you know, even one day. You know, it's just like he has this line, which I, I'm just bungled, but it, it's like it makes me cry every single time. And you only get that from listening to the whole essay and running, if you will, along with him through all of these seasons with ice on his beard and sweat and, you know. And, and so that switches the modes, right, for them. They go, like, oh, and I even had one student in my class this last uh, fall who said exactly that. She's like, I didn't see any of this. You know, and it's a very simple essay, but she missed it because she was reading it as information because that's the way that we're taught to read, right, as information, not as experience. But that's not the way it's designed to be. It's not how much information can I get out of this? So that's what I would do. Yes. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned your first point in the talk was poetry invites us to see the beauty uh, of creation, and then you mentioned uh, Christ being the kind of pinnacle of that. So I was curious if you could elaborate maybe a little bit more on that second half when it comes to Jesus and his ministry or his life. Um, just what role do you see us looking at that play in terms of seeing beauty through poetry, or if there are specific poems or works of literature that you feel like bring out um, the beauty of Christ? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And the reason why it's such a good question is because Colossians chapter two, which I quoted from, you know, Christ is before all things, created all things, and in whom all things hold together. When I was a new faculty member at Wheaton College, I got to be in a, an advanced faith and learning seminar with Mark Knoll, and it was on Christology, right? And he gave us that Colossians 2 as kind of our meditation throughout the whole uh, time that we were together. And I remember resisting, you know, like, uh, you know, I know what this says, but I do it now in Electio Divina for my first year seminar because it's all about Christ at the core. It's literally called Christ at the core, our curriculum. <laughs> and it's just like when you hear that over and over again and you let that sink in, before all things, made all things, in whom all things hold together, he is the form. So the reason why I like Baltazar so much is because the glory of the form, that first volume of his theological aesthetics, it's like the form of the world is Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate form. He is the beauty of the world. And so the beauty that the world has comes from him as created by him. Yes, fallen. Yes, smeared with toil and sweat and all of that. But um, there to be discovered. You know, so it ultimately leads you back to Christ if you really dig into it um, and understand that. But of course, um, our world doesn't want to accept that. Um, but now, with regard to particular poems that might um, help, you know, suggest that, I'd have to do some more thinking about it, but I, I really think Denise Lovertov is, is a good poet to turn to um, where you can see that kind of um, incarnational reality come through um, the, the poems themselves. There is a poem and she wrote this before she was technically converted you know, to, to Christianity. It's a poem called Jacob's Ladder. And it talks about how when a man is going up the steps, which it's a metaphor for poetry, because the, the last line is the poem ascends. You've got to grope. You, you're on the stone stairway. You know, It's sharp angles. It hurts. There's pain and the angels are coming down while you're groping your way up. And, and so it's like the reality of the incarnation is the, the thing that's, that Jesus is that stairway. He is, but it, his incarnation means that he knows pain and suffering and the difficulty of that. 
And the poem just beautifully um, invites you into that experience. And then there's a poem, Oh, Taste and See, by her as well. So, uh. You know, one thing I'm hearing from you and some of the answers you're giving is just the importance, really, of slowing down enough even to notice the glory of Christ as it does come indirectly, and that there's some poems that are not going to be on, on its face named Jesus Christ or after a doctrine. Nevertheless, an attentive reader full of wonder and discernment is going to be able to see one of the refractions of the glory of Christ through that poem in a way that's going to open up maybe even some of the poetry of Scripture itself from Colossians. Uh, Agreed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, it's interesting because, um, you know, N.T. Wright, we teach his book Simply Christian, and the first three chapters talk about these, these echoes uh, in all of our experiences, echoes of God and of our need for God in all of our experiences. And then at the end of, like, the, the third chapter, it, it, he's talking about this is why we need the arts. And it's just this kind of throwaway line. I'm like, yeah, but could you develop that for a whole chapter? Because it, it, it's, it's like there is no other way to really see, um, to access that beauty as experience, yes. right? Yes. Thanks, Christina. Um, any writer's greatest fear, or perhaps especially a poet's greatest fear, is handing a poem to someone, <laughs> and they read it, and then they say, what does it mean? which is also an experience you have if you're just sharing a poem that you like and you give to somebody and they can't seem, you know, the, their first response is, I don't get it. And I'm curious, I guess, two things. One, how you tend to respond to that question. I often want to say, well, it means what it says. You know, that, there's no more yes. meaning to turn into prose or something like that. I'm also curious how you try to read and appreciate poems you don't quite understand. Um, Ooh, okay. Ooh, that's a really, <laughs> that last one in particular. Um, Jeffrey Hill would be the poet that I just don't get. He's so hard, you know. Um, and I, my advice to myself, which of course becomes my advice to other readers, is either memorize it or just sit with it with other people for, you know, longer periods of time. But even if after that it doesn't resonate with you, it's okay. <laughs> Virginia Woolf's um, dad, <laughs> used to say, there are lots of great things written. If you read something that somebody else considers to be great, then it is not resonating with you, or whatever he said, just move on and read something else, right? Because there are plenty of things. Like, so I don't feel like learning how to read Jeffrey Hill is necessary for my soul, though I have found that some people really, really resonate with him. Now, that's not the same thing, as you know, of just giving up. Right, um, you, you know, you want to, ideally in your English classes, but in, in your life, you know, you, you want to seek somebody who might know a little bit more about it and just say, hey, what do you, you know? Uh, but that's why I love the idea of having a group, you know, a group discussion, because you can work that out together, and then the beauties of, of the poem just kind of unfold right in front of everybody's um, eyes, like we did when that workshop that uh, that uh, Josh was talking about. I, I just let them experience this poem and then talk about it, and it started to unfold for them. You've spoken of uh, poetry that points us to the beauty of creation and resonates with the awe and wonder we have. But there's been this thread, even in a lot of the poems you mentioned, of of sadness, mm -hmm. of sorrow, of pain. Um, could you speak more directly to how poetry that reflects on the grotesque or the horrible or the terrible aspects of life and humanity um, are also a theological invitation? Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned your, it was it Jackson who points at the sky and says, look yeah. and see. Um, but there are many children who also, you know, we can imagine are looking and pointing at horrible things, a, a missile in the sky, a, you know, all these different things. Could you just speak more directly to what we should do to handle that poetry responsibly. Yeah, no, that's a, a, a great question for a Flannery O'Connor scholar, such as I am, because she lived in the, the world of the grotesque. And the reason why she traded in the grotesque is because she, she strongly believed that you can't see evil for what it is unless you have a sense of what's good, right? So seeing evil, looking at it in its face, though not fun, points to the good and the beautiful that are absent from it. Like, right, we know that um, evil is the absence of good. That's Augustine's definition that I think is a very good one, right? Um, so I'm a fan of Cormac McCarthy, 
um, and he really gets down in, you know, and, but once you start exposing that and looking at it aesthetically, it, it strips away all the sentimentality and gives you a real response to, uh, to the beauty that it depends upon, to the goodness that it depends upon. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, you can't, you only know what a rotten apple is because you know what a good one should look like, right? So when, you, when, a, when a poet puts a rotten apple in your face, right, um, it evokes longing, if you will, for the, for the good apple, right? Now, that doesn't mean I want to live in there the entire, like, I don't want to live in Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, but I see the value of sort of getting down in the trenches. Think about um, Guernica, you know, the, the, the painting by Picasso. That's a really good example. And I use that deliberately because the painting, is, it, actually, I think um, Cormac McCarthy is evoking it in um, Blood Meridian. Um, not directly, but it's the same effect. There, you could call the painting beautiful, even though it depicts the ugliest of things. Why? Because it's truthfully depicting, you know, this. And it's not trying to put a glaze over the top of it. Now, beautiful is not the same thing as pretty. Do I want Guernica, you know, in my house? No. Do I want, you know, but it, it, there is something that's gained um, from the study of poems that, or works of art or whatever it is, that, that really face it, that face it. Christina, I want to ask a question about um, the, the um, poetry of scripture and how it both um, shocks and consoles in a way that our souls need at, at, at the deepest levels. Uh, and so can you talk about the scriptures that are poetic um, that you think, you know, in the year 2024 would be good medicine and good nourishment for, for our souls? Oh, of course, now you're just like, what are your favorite psalms is kind of what this is, right? Ultimately, um, and again, not being a Hebrew scholar, part of the reason why I studied and worked on American literature is because I don't like literature and translation because I feel like I miss so much of it, and, and I think that's especially true with the language of Hebrew, right? Um, I, I know that I'm missing it, and it kind of frustrates me, you know? That being said, there are, of course, deeply poetic moments, right, all across. And for me, they become like my favorite things that are just in my soul, because you, you, know, you memorize them as you do, you treasure it, you, you hide it in your heart, right? Um, Psalm 121 is the first thing that comes to mind. You know, I look up to the hills. From where comes my help? You know, not from there. My help comes from the Lord, you know? And that's a very poetic moment. You know, and there's, there are lots, as you all know, of those throughout. I love um, leading people in Electio Divina with Psalm 23 because they feel like they know it, right? But when you actually like hear it and hear the poetry of it, he restores my soul, becomes just this magnificent central point, you know, of, of that. And there's so many other beautiful metaphors within that, that as well. So, um, it, you know, and that is the trick, isn't it? I mean, one of the things about having poetry, these new poets are poets that are new to you, is that you're not going to be tempted to fall into, I know this already. So reading the scripture and studying the Psalms and meditating on the Psalms is going to, you have to work against that, right? That's why I think the, the genius of Eugene Peterson's message was that, right? It's defamiliarizing it for you and helping you hear it again. You know, and I love his translation of that passage. I think it's in Matthew where, you know, um, Jesus is saying, walk with me, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. You know, <laughs> and it's, it's never been translated. You know, I know it's a paraphrase. Don't, don't attack me. Um, and it, it's like, oh, yeah, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Walk with me. I'll show you how to have rest for your souls, you know? It's because I, I happen to think that one of the best definitions of, of poetry and all of the literary arts is that it's defamiliarization, like it's using language in a way that defamiliarizes, shocks us, wakes us up, uh, helps us to see things that we thought we knew, but we really didn't. And as, a, as a, someone who wants to minister 
the, the poetry of scripture as well as to draw from the poetry um, in, in, you know, just that we have access to that, um, that would help refract uh, those beauties and those realities. What are things that you would tell me not to do and tell us all not to do as, as preachers and teachers and ministers um, and disciples and, and what to replace that with? What bugs you? What about bugs how me? people use poetry and I, sermons, yes, etc. I have uh, mentioned this before, but using it as like an example really irks me, right? Like it, it's not, you don't use poetry in, or, or an example from... Guilty, uh, yeah, sorry. Right, right. Um, it, which is not to say that quoting a poem is always using it, right? Um, so just do anything that avoids treating... A, a work of art, a poem, uh, you know, any sort, a piece of music or whatever, as, as if you could, as illustrative of some content, right? Like turning it into information because it's experience, right? So if, if you translate an experience, what should be an experience of something into pure information, you've killed it. You know, you've just by definition destroyed its potential for power, its potentially transformative power. But you have an immense um, um, opportunity, yes. you know, to just even at the very end, you know, of your sermon to say like, now this may seem unrelated, but let, let me walk you through this poem. Let me read this poem, you know, a, a couple of times and then share some things with you, you know, and, and you know, help them to have the experience of it. I've, I've given homilies before. I'm a real big fan of homilies, like short. Uh, where it was just Lectio Divina type things, where I've just said, I just want you to hear these words in a different way. Um, I've done chapel talks like that too, and invariably, especially when I do chapel talks for undergraduates, they'll come to me and say, that, is, that was amazing. Because they're used to just information, information, information. You know, so if we can avoid thinking of sermons as just information giving, that's a start. That's the biggest start. Well, one thing that I'm inspired to do, uh, Christina, is to just let poetry be a way in to prayer and into the presence of God, um, not as an end in itself, but as, as a way of truly as enjoying Him and enjoying the, the salvation He brings, as well as the way that we can experience it together. So thank you so much for your talk. Um, and I'll just, one, any final questions before, before we close? Oh, Simone Vey Simone Ve said that attention to something is a form of prayer, and that's what you're talking about there. Like when you're attentive to a, po to, to a poem, it's a form of, of prayer. Amen. And may we all grow in that capacity and that delight. Um, so let me pray for us. The Lord be with you. So with you. Let us pray. We ask now, Lord, uh, that the poetry that you have given us, especially in the pages of Holy Scripture, and certainly, Lord, through the saints and the sages throughout the ages, would be uh, just our treasures. Let it not collect dust in the wine cellar, Lord. Uh, give us the will as well as the delight to, uh, to pull out the fine wine uh, that helps us savor uh, and see the goodness of God. Um, and uh, the glories of the gospel. And we do uh, ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would alight upon us um, so that our lives would be a, a poetic prayer to you and a witness to the world uh, of the beauty to come in the new creation. We pray this all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Henry Center, for hosting this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Lake. Let's give her a final hand.